Hi, hello and welcome. It's me, Nella Fahidayat, and you are streaming Dear World Live. Education, I would like to argue, plays a hugely important role in leveling the playing field. How do we actually ensure women's inclusion? How do we ensure women's safety? Hi, hello, and welcome. My name is Nella Fahidaya. This is a special edition of Dear World Live brought to you by Doha Debates. We are indeed in Milan, brought to you live. I've never said that before. The show is usually online, and I have my wonderful guests as little squares on a board for me. So this is indeed a treat for me. Now, in this season of Dear World Live, we are going to be talking about uh, the climate crisis. And in this very special episode, Live from Milan, we are trying to understand the issues around representation in the climate conversation. Representation in the climate conversation. In this season, we're going to be trying to understand and, and, and listen to and amplify young people's voices, which is more important now than ever before. At Doha Debates, our motto is, think solutions. How can we move together towards the solutions we want to achieve? So my hope is, and I'm hoping my panelists can help me in this, by the way, that you leave this room armed with some tools, some help, some ideas, and some guidance that will help you achieve your goals when it comes to tackling the climate conversation. OK, it's time to begin. So we are going to start off with some cold, hard facts. Just a few days ago, we heard the results of a huge global study. 10,000 young people between the ages of 16 and 25 were surveyed in 10 countries all over the world. Overall, 75% of young respondents said the future is frightening. 64% of young people said that governments were not doing enough to avoid the climate crisis. The study's authors were, were so worried, they concluded that young people were indeed suffering, quote, profound psychological distress as a result of the way the conversations are happening around climate change and climate change itself. The stakes couldn't be any higher. And, and this is the response from young people themselves. My hope is, in the next 40 minutes, that we will tackle how we can alleviate some of these issues. So we will first hear from our speakers when it comes to the issue of representation in the climate conversation. Then uh, we will get stuck into some of the big questions keeping us all up at night. I'll explain more later. After that, I will be getting to grill my panelists on the points they make. And then the mic will be yours so that you can put your questions directly to them. Now on Dear World Live over the coming weeks, because this is episode one of season four, we will have few more coming. We'll be focusing on listening to activists around the world and trying to amplify their voices so that people in leadership positions hear their concerns. And we thought, what better way than to do that uh, here today after the summit that we've all been going to, hope, hopefully witnessing. Um, what better way to do that than to have two wonderful activists from Qatar join two change makers and thought leaders. So this is a little bit of an experiment, but that's what Dear World Live is. We try things out and see how far we get. Um, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to see if we can find some agreement or disagreement amongst them and hopefully uh, impart some help and advice to you guys. Without any further ado, it's time to meet my panelists. I'm joined by Jayatma Wickramanayaka, the United Nations Secretary General's Envoy on Youth, representing their voices to the UN. Jayatma works to expand the United Nations youth engagement and she advises the United Nations Secretary General. Kathleen Rogers is the president of Earth Day Network and has worked for more than 20 years as an environmental lawyer. Nishad Shafi 
is a Qatari-based environmentalist and executive director of Arab Youth Climate Movement. And Lina Al Tarawni is the co founder of Green Mangroves, a not for profit project that brought people together on kayaks to protect mangroves in Qatar's natural landscape. So, that's been a very long intro. I hope you're still awake. I hope you're still here. Let's get into it. Now, before uh, we got all of this together, my wonderful panelists, I asked you to start thinking about what representation in the climate conversation means, because it could mean anything, and it means different things to all of us. So I want to spend maybe three, two, three minutes each to go around and to get your remarks uh, about this. Jayathma, I'd like to come to you first. Representation in the climate conversation, how do you interpret that, and what are the challenges um, ahead of us when we're trying to tackle maybe diversity, uh, not just of race or gender, but in all forms that you and I have spoken about before at Doha Debates? Thank you very much, Nell. Um, I have to though, disagree with your introduction of uh, categorizing our two youth speakers as, as activists and Kathleen and myself in, on the other side. So I very much like to think of myself as an activist on sabbatical leave uh, that, is, uh, that is working for the UN. Um, but to come back to your question on um, what does diversity and representation and inclusiveness mean in, in the youth climate movement or in the climate movement in general, um, I think the real representation is where the voices of the people who are most affected by an issue is heard. So when we talk about representation in the climate movement or the youth climate movement, for me, it is really the hearing the voices of young people coming from areas where climate change has impacted the most. So young people coming from small island developing states, young people coming from sub-Saharan Africa, young people coming from communities that today, not in the future, today as we speak, are grappling with the issues of climate change by not having enough water, by not having enough rain, by droughts, by rising sea levels. I'm talking about young women and girls who face increased gender-based violence because of the climate crisis. In many places where there's not enough water for families to cook, for an example, in sub-Saharan Africa, in rural places, young women have to walk more and more miles to find water for their families. And in this process, they get raped, they get sexually exploited, they get harassed, kidnapped. They become victims of conflicts between tribes that are fighting for depleting resources. I'm talking about the young indigenous people who are losing their rights to their lands. So uh, for me, the representation of the climate movement is really putting the voices of those who are being most affected at the front and center of our conversation. Well, over the years, I've followed you, um, and you are one of the best people at doing that, but you've set the stage for us. The, the stakes are high, and the time we have to address these is getting less and less. And if I'm hearing you correctly, your main point is that representation, not just in the direct sense of the word, but all the indirect ways that the climate crisis is affecting people being heard, represented, and resources uh, getting to them. Kathleen, you have the floor. So that was very really interesting response. Uh, because I work for Earth Day. I came from the activist background, and I'm a lawyer. Um, one of the things I did in a large part of my life was representing communities through filing lawsuits. I love to sue people. It is actually really fun. And depending on the country you're in or the international forum, it's, um, it's almost, uh, it's really entertaining and really exciting. And for the most part, because the laws are on our side, we win. Uh, but my new role, uh, my continuing role at Earth Day is to represent the billion people who participate in Earth Day. And that means representing a big tent, including, I'd say, many more than a billion people for whom climate change does not occur to them, is not part of their lives. They don't take any action. Um, it's not as if they're content and not as if they don't read. And so we often describe Earth Day as representing everybody else, meaning those people who are not deep green, those people who are not youth activists, those people um, who don't take daily actions in their lives. So I represent a large number of people, um, and there are activists and um, politicians and mayors in our network, which is enormous. Uh, but again, I think our focus is on representing the people and, and in turn trying to change their mind. 
um, for those that are still don't understand uh, that they are required to do something to participate, to vote the right way, to take action in their consumer life. And I'll give you a quick example. After a huge hurricane hit um, Staten Island, I mentioned that to you earlier, um, it's a conservative area of New York, which is odd. New York's very progressive. And uh, basically, the hurricane mowed down the entire community. And they interviewed a bunch of women after the event who had lost all their houses. And 100% of them said, when asked about climate change and would they become advocates, they all said no. This was a one-time event. They weren't interested, nor were they compelled to take action to change their leadership in their community or to deal with those obvious questions that presented themselves. So in addition to representing activists and representing green greenies, as we call them, I'm in this weird position of also having to represent and change the minds of those people who don't care. Thank you. Kathleen, that's an incredibly important point. So if I'm hearing you, what you're saying is representation isn't only about the people that elect and put themselves forward and say, hey, hey, listen to me, hear me. It's about the people that are either disenfranchised or just don't have the information in order to be represented in the first place. Food for thought. Uh, let's get to our other two uh, 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 panelists. Nishad, over to you. Representation in the climate conversation. OK, so I'm going to share my personal experience of representation. What you asked right now was back in 2015 when I got to attend the COP21 in Paris. And I saw there was a vacuum of uh, young people from the Arab region as such. So when I had the discussion there, I understood that young people were in part of the climate conversation. Like, it was all whitewashed by the global north. So why wasn't the young people from the south, including West Asia, was not part of the larger conversation beyond their country because it's not just one country issue. So that motivated me to understand that uh, the stakes are high and all the young people, like what we had today at the, the Youth for Climate Summit, representation is key from region, uh, beyond religion, indigenous community, from all works of life, can be an engineer, a student, and even can be uh, as young as like 15 or 12 year old, which I met here was a profound example for me to say how we can represent young people. So that representation means beyond the works of life and re region and religion, and that representation is key if we want to have that equitable and inclusive climate action or climate work of young people. Lena, over to you. Representation, the climate conversation. Um, all right. So as a medical student, I'm a third year medical student, I've gone through this dilemma of not finding the space for climate change in what I do. And um, I would basically spend hours and hours studying minute details of anatomy while there were forest fires in Australia. And I would feel so confused and angry at the same time. And I would think, had I studied ecology, for example, or policy, I would have been able to make bigger change. Uh, but then I realized that we can create spaces for climate change conversations in whatever field we actually choose. And for example, in medicine, uh, medicine and climate change activism are both healing processes. So if you're able to improve um, the lifestyle of the people, if we're able to reduce the chronic diseases that are because of um, degraded landscapes, cancers because of chemical pollutions, we are ultimately leading to both outcomes at the same time. And there's been this amazing pilot project in Norway that actually investigates um, building wooden cabins and regenerating landscapes for pediatric patients who, live, who go to hospitals. Um, so if we're able to basically find climate change in whatever that we do, so we don't find this gap between going to work one day and then oh, I'm a climate change activist on the side. They can be both brought together. And I think representing climate change in whatever that we do is something we can all look forward to. So we've heard from my panelists exactly on what we mean by representation and the varied ideas of what they are. The idea that it's not just one group of people that should be holding the mic. Lena uh, talking about the climate. You don't stop being an activist when you start work or go home. You are an activist and you must find climate change and, 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 cha and changing the scenario or the context of it in every area of your life. So now we move on to another section of the show. Every night when we go home, when we go to sleep, and it's two o'clock in the morning, sometimes our eyes ping open and we're like, the earth is on fire. The floods are coming, the hurricanes are getting worse. These weather events that we were told were once in a lifetime are happening again and again. And sometimes, I bet, the climate crisis just keeps you up at night. So I wanted to spend a little time asking you the questions that keep you up at night. Because when it comes to the climate crisis, sometimes it's very hard to connect with the issue itself. 
But the questions are all there, innate in all of us. So if I can just come to some of you here at the front row and ask you, when it comes to the climate crisis, what kind of things are keeping you up? If you tell me your name and then just, just give me what, what's on your mind. My name is Noura and what me, keeps me up at night is thinking about the people who don't have access to resources to amplify their own voices, especially people in developing countries that technology is not a viable option to have their voices heard. Diverse economic backgrounds, that's a really good one. So how can people who are disenfranchised in that way engage with the conversation? What about you? Hello, everyone. My name is Maryam. And as someone with experience in advocating climate change and climate action, what keeps me up at night is like for when I started, I always wondered, how do I take action? How can I be a part of this? Who do I go for? Very good. And what is your name and what is on your mind? What keeps you up at night? Uh, my name is uh, Abdullah and uh, I'm a climate advocate and what's keeping me up at night is the, the fear of my voice not being heard and included in the climate conversation uh, and be, because the countries and governments aren't implementing climate good agendas, climate positive agendas. So getting that agenda, uh, getting climate at the top of agendas is something that you're thinking about. What about you? Hi everyone, my name is Kayana. What keeps me up is, at night is that I feel that youth are often sidelined in the climate conversation. So how can we keep them con continuously involved in this conversation? Very good. And finally, yourself. Hello, I'm Nathan. And as youth activists, we all want an end to the blah, blah, blahs. But I think that the lack of climate education makes us feel hopeless. And so how do we empower this generation to finally take action? That is a good one. And, and in fact, it's so good. I'm going to steal that question for the next part of our panel, because now it's time for me to grill you. That, that great question from Nathan, should we be teaching uh, climate science in schools? Should we be teaching activism in schools? Should we be teaching how to be better local and international activists? At the moment, this is all extracurricular. So everyone who's in here cares about this. How do we get people who aren't aware to care? Jayathma, to you first with that question. Yeah, I completely agree that com climate education is key. And yesterday I was listening to a panel that Kathleen was moderating at the Youth for Climate event that we are all here for in Milan, where she brought together ministers and young people together to have a conversation about climate action, um, climate education. And uh, what I learned was that from the side of the young people that there is a huge ask that climate education be systematically included into educational curriculums. Because for most of us, we learned about climate change on our own. Um, I think it will be true for both of you. It's certainly for me. I did not learn about climate change in school. And I remember once seeing a magazine with a polar bear um, on, a, on a melting ice cap and thinking, oh, this is climate change. You know, this is something that happens to polar bears in the North Pole and not to me, where in my own country, Sri Lanka, um, farmers were committing suicide um, for um, not having enough rain uh, to do their harvesting and then not having enough money to pay their debts uh, because of the impacts that were caused by the climate crisis. So um, I think this type of awareness only comes to young people if it is a part of the information that you get as a young person when you shape your formative years. So for, for me, from me, it's a big yes for climate education. So, so Lida, let me come to you next. I just want to get your perspective on this. As I've been walking around the Youth for Climate Summit in the last two days, I've probably bumped into a lot of you here. Um, the, the general sense of anxiety and even people saying the word depressed, like young people are depressed about everything that is and is not happening. It seems to me that we need to learn to better care for ourselves as activists. So with that in mind, with so many of the people that I spoke to talking about that, what advice do you have for young people when it comes to prioritizing their mental health and well-being as activists? Um, thank you for the question. Um, so in climate change, it's so, so easy to stay up at night with all these questions because you just see the world that you really care about, the nature that you love so much kind of dissipating into thin air. And um, my like throughout working with green mangroves, I think... I realized that we have to act out of fierce love and not out of fear because... Say that one more time. I love that. <laughs> I read her notes when she said this and I just fell in love. That's a tweet. That's a tweet. Okay, everyone, get ready for this tweet. Say it again. Uh, we have to act out of fierce love and not out of fear because we cannot really drive darkness out by darkness. It can only be driven out by light. So um, 
if you have that in mind, you really connect to these natural spaces. And I think that's what we do at Green Mangroves. We take people outside to the outdoors to explore these places, to look at the sparkling water, to see the flamingos. And once people connect with these places, it's so easy for them to fall in love with them. And people love what, protect what they love. So go outdoor, put on your hiking shoes, uh, go kayaking, go on a ri bike ride, explore the world. Yeah, I think that's my advice. That's a, that's a great bit of advice, actually. Or go to the beach like I did, and you don't have to do anything. You just sit there and admire the lovely waves. Um, Nishad, if I might come to you next. Another shocking figure that we heard, I, I mentioned earlier, is that 64% number, 64% of young people say governments are not doing enough to avoid the climate crisis. Imagine being a young person today, like many of you are, and feeling like your governments, your leaders, don't have your future in their hearts and in their minds when they're making policy. I mean, that's, that's a grave concern. How do we convince our political leaders to stop talking like politicians and start acting like they need to save the world? Well, I mean, creating accountability is through some of the event, like what we did uh, the last two did, uh, days in Milan, is to make the leaders accountable. We are actually talking to the leaders face to face and asking you have been enough of talking. Now what we need is to action and has to be concrete. And the youth recommendation which is coming out is giving the clear pathway what young people want to see, not in like 2030 or 2050, in the next five, two, three years. So they've been concrete on that. Of course, our leaders may leave you behind, but I think young people are making sure they would make their leaders accountable. Let me, let me play devil's advocate, which is something that I don't like doing, but I want to, with, with, with you folks, our, our change makers or our, or, or our thought leaders, if you've been doing it for this long, Kathleen, and, and there's still a need for Earth Day, it means that they're not listening, are they? Because if they were listening, there would be no need for the work that you do. You know, and a couple things. So um, first is that young people do not vote in anywhere the same numbers that older people vote. That's a fact in every country, give or take a couple, few, a couple of countries. And in other countries, your vote could be meaningless. Uh, but for the majority of democracies, I think the problem is that people haven't voted around the environment. A small percentage do. If we can convince people to vote for climate change leaders, those leaders that will take care of our needs and also project into the future and look ahead, then maybe we can change things. But as long as the status quo is maintained by leaders who give lip service to climate change, or in those countries um, where there's no... But surely we need the leaders before we can vote for them. I mean, who, who are we going to vote for if those leaders aren't there for us? Oh, they are there. You have to look at every slate and around the world. There are always green candidates. Now, they may not be as green as youth want them to be. Um, but I think the important thing is holding leaders accountable, going back on the streets. And I don't like to see youth as fiery as our youth are. They need to go back on the streets. Most of the big social revolutions have taken place because people, young people, have time who are active and energetic will go out into the streets. Now, COVID has ruined it for many, many people. But voting, activism on the streets, being loud, holding your leaders accountable, our corporations accountable, becoming green consumers. These things are all tied together. Mm -hmm. But again, as long as we feel marginalized and don't see the road um, to activism or to voting, then our options will be constrained. One last quick thing, which is the question around education. My organization and lots of other ones, but Earth Day's been leading it, for the COP in Glasgow, and many young people have demanded it here, that they insist on climate, mandatory climate education, and more important even, in a way, is civic skill building. Because as I told you in the beginning, I like to sue people. Well, people who develop civic skills, no matter what the country, can hold their governments to account. And so it's really important to teach climate literacy and teach them civic skills. OK, so just before we go on to the final question from me, this is your reminder that uh, we only have a short amount of time before we get to the question, to, to your questions for our panel. So here are the COVID rules in Milan today. If you have a question that you want to ask, please make your way over to this side of the stage. Please stand on one person per step or about a meter apart. Then, when the time comes, I will call you forward. You can sit on the seat uh, over there. 
please don't touch my mic or try and hold my mic. I will hold it to you, and then you uh, can pose your question directly to our panelists. So if you do have a question at any point from now, please make your way over there, uh, form a queue, and we can come to you uh, if that's OK. So you can move from now onwards. My very last question then, and perhaps to all of you is, we've spoken about the different kinds of representation. Um, and in fact, I didn't even think about half the things you very clever, intelligent, and active people have said. But sometimes I just feel bad. I have a bad day. Um, and I don't know if my voice is being heard. I don't know how many tweets I can send, and I don't know where all those tweets are going. So one little solution from you guys. What do you do when you're having a bad day when it comes to the activism and the work that you do? Lena, I'm going to come to you first if I can. What do you do on a bad day? that we can, uh, some advice we can take home with us. Um, Maya Angelou once said, I stand this one, but I come as 10,000. And uh, I think when you have a really bad day and when you see your project is kind of stuck, you're not working where you really want to be, um, it really helps to remember all of the people who've supported you before and just kind of see them standing behind you as people who are propelling you forward. Um, because the work that you're doing is also the product of other people's work. Um, and I think that continues on the legacy of them, and it continues the legacy of you. So I'd love, I love to remember the people who have supported me on this, and that pushes me forward. I love that. Uh, Nishad, we'll come to you next. What advice do you have on when you're having a bad day? Well, I echo the same. I mean, I would look after my team, who has been always a constant support to me, and also to all these people out here. It's not a one-man battle. You need to be together as a collective work. So stand for one another. It's a long day and a long way forward. Kathleen? Yeah, I would agree with both of them. Um, you know, having a very diverse staff from around the world, um, I often think about uh, staff, for example, in Africa, who against all odds um, are doing extraordinary work uh, and making their way. Most of them are very young. And then on a really personal level, um, for somebody who's a little bit of a workaholic, which is embarrassing, but very American, um, I go outside. Um, I want to go see those mangroves. Um, because often I'll find myself able to calm down and refocus and then, sadly, just go back to work. Jayatma? <laughs> yeah, I, I find it fascinating how we're all coping the same way. But for me as well, it is about thinking the small wins that we've had in the past, you know. Um, a lot of people ask me, how did I get this job? And I tell them that, Actually, my job didn't even exist when I was in university. Um, so the youth movement have been pushing so much to have a seat at the table for the first time. We have a, somebody under the age of 30 in the Secretary General's cabinet. So uh, I think uh, through persistent advocacy and work, uh, that change is possible. Um, so fi I find comfort in the fact that we've been able to get some wins over the, in, over the past few years. I like that. Remember the wins, because the struggles are long and far. So it is now time for the final part of the Deal World Live here, live from Milan. So if I can, I'm going to ask one by one, if you guys can come over, um, sit down here, and then please don't touch the mic. Uh, take a seat, and then we will ask a question. So just if you just say what your question is, and then who it is for, that would be great. Uh, my question is, towards uh, Kathleen and uh, I was wondering when you talked about uh, electing uh, officials that are pro-climate and uh, want to make change, what about in countries where there aren't elections and countries that don't have a democracy? Uh, how are they supposed to elect people? Thankfully, uh, I come from a country where the Amir is pro-climate uh, action, but what about the people who aren't uh, from that country? Excellent question, Kathleen. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a very difficult uh, situation. There are many countries that are um, top down and your vote either can't happen or it doesn't matter because there are also elections that are fixed everywhere in the world. So I think, uh, again, and there those same countries, you may not be able to be an activist. You may not be able to go out and protest. Um, fortunately, um, if social media isn't completely controlled, and by the way, in some countries it is completely controlled, and those countries are important. There are many, many very large countries that basically shut down all opposition. And so for those countries, um, maintaining whatever m method you can of social interaction with other people that believe in what you think and you believe in what they think is critically important. But I agree, there are not just a handful of countries, uh, but many, and many of those countries are really instrumental 
in uh, pulling the entire world forward um, in the conversation. So um, I think we just have to count on those countries with free elections and opportunities to interact to offset what's going on with uh, those countries where you have no vote. Kathleen, thank you. Uh, the rest of my panelists, if at any point you want to jump in on a question afterwards, please feel free to do so. I am, for example, from Afghanistan, and the recent uh, events that have unfolded in the country that I'm from have seen what happens when freedoms, liberties, hard fought and hard won are lost within the space of mere months. So for those of us here who do live in countries where we have a voice, where we're able to express ourselves, it is incumbent on us to do more. Jayathma. Yeah, I also just want to add to what Kathleen said. I think international pressure also adds a lot to, to push leaders to do better, right? Um, uh, I think uh, participating in forums like the Youth for Climate, like being at the COP, and um, working with your peers to make them uh, put pressure on their governments to in return put pressure on, on their peers, which are the governments that you're talking about, is also a good way to, I think, push this conversation forward. Because um, we live, unfortunately, we live in a world where governments are also constantly competing with each other uh, to say, I'm the first who reached this goal, I'm the first who reached this target. So I think having that type of pressure from outside also, in, in, in addition to what is coming from the inside, could help us move in the direction of uh, achieving positive goals. Uh, what I'm hearing is they often are the first to move the goal posts rather than to achieve the goals. Nishad, very quickly, and then we'll get another question. I'll be in. very quick. Like, bottom-up approach also work. I mean, some of the countries are not even democratic. There are a lot of leaders within the government who are pro and who supports that work. So keep doing your work at the grassroots. Uh, definitely, they are identified and supported, and that would uh, instantly become a national uh, work. So keep doing at the very local level, and irrespective of what type of government, they will listen to you. Okay, what is your question and who is it for? Don't touch the mic, oh my God. Uh, my question is for Kathleen. Uh, so as the president of Earth Day, uh, do you think that the issue of uh, climate refugees is already bigger, oh sorry, will get bigger than it already is? As I'm really worried about how like policies of governments can change and how you know people can act towards refugees. Kathleen, the question is, is yes, quickly, uh, yeah, I, I got it. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, climate refugees are already on the move. Um, they're at the border of the United States, and we're not treating them all that hospitably, and they'll be on the move. And many, many, many of them are moving north um, to get out of dry regions, regions with con other conflicts that, by the way, turn out to be environmental or climate related. So. Um, it's possible that a huge percentage of the world's populations will begin to move away from where they are. Even in the United States, we're seeing people move away from hotter areas and looking for some sort of respite from the heat, and we're just beginning to see it. So the climate refugee um, issue, if to go back to what keeps me up at night, is one of those issues. Diathma, I want to come to you next, because, uh, for example, on the continent of Africa, the largest cohort of young people to ever exist on that continent. More young people now in Africa than at any other point in human history. You represent them and their voices. The, keeping it real and making sure she's in the hot seat herself. When you are in those rooms, and, and I've made this point before, the climate activist movement is diverse and varied, and yet the leaders tend to be from a homogenous group, powerful men. And that disconnect can cause lots of friction. So how do you represent those refugees or the future refugees um, uh, when it comes to kind of getting the voices heard on, on, a, on a national, international level? Yeah, I think first of all, it's unfortunate that at the UN we still do not recognize uh, climate refugees because this was a big part of the negotiations in the refugee compact and um, governments didn't really agree to this language becoming sort of an internationally recognized language. But as Kathleen said, it's no longer about sort of some normative recognition. It is a reality that we are seeing right now. Um, but also, for an example, countries like Bangladesh are, are extremely vulnerable to um, having climate refugees. And of course, our friends who are living in the small island developing states um, or already have indications by 2030, by 2035, uh, they will not have their homes or their islands. So it's uh, it's unfortunately now not not a choice, uh, but a reality for for many people who who are stuck in these um, 
conditions that they did not create at the first place, right? People in Bangladesh did not create climate change. People in Haiti did not create climate change. People in the small island states did not create climate change. So um, that contrasts with, Nell, what you are saying, because uh, unfortunately, many of our decision-making rooms are filled with uh, mostly white men in suits and ties, right? That is changing. I think that's changing, but uh, slowly. Uh, for an example, today we had this dialogue with youth representatives and, and uh, ministers at the Youth for Climate. The majority of them were men and men from the global north. Um, so we had to really find those women leaders in the room to call them on and you know bring them into this conversation because this wasn't something that was happening by default. Um, but for an example, in the, in the peace building sector, we say that when women are at the peace mediation or peace negotiation tables, peace agreements are 38% more likely to be successful than it's being negotiated with just a group of men. Um, so would I, I would apply that same uh, principle or, or, or the same uh, values to then also the climate negotiations and climate conversations to say not just women, but women of color, people with disabilities, indigenous people, refugees, Everyone, the microcosm of society, should have a seat at the table when it comes to deciding these most important issues. Thank you. I've got a couple of more questions, and I want to get to them before our time runs out. So what is your question, and who is it for? Uh, my question is, how do we ensure that people who, as I mentioned previously, people who live in less economically developed countries, people who don't have access to technology, where technology and social media are not a viable option, can amplify their issues in the climate action conversation? And my question is directed to... Ms. Jayathma. Jayathma. I think there are a few different ways you can do that. I don't think uh, social media is the only tool or technology is the only tool that communities have to bring attention to the issues uh, that they're grappling with. Um, for an example, in this conference itself, we've had young people you know, who are coming from the Caribbean to get today, for an example, coming collectively and, and issuing a statement about the issues that they are facing in their countries. A young woman from Lebanon talking about, you know, are you crazy? You're talking about energy transition. Like my grandmother doesn't even have electricity in her in her house. So I think this type of real, honest, frank discussions need to be had that we are not all at, at the same level, even though we are talking about sort of the same policies or, or the same transition. So this common but differentiated responsibility, I think, is a very important uh, point we need to keep in mind. So we don't also put the responsibility on these people who are already struggling with these issues to now find their, themselves a way to express themselves or find solutions to the issues their communities are struggling with. We are thinking about it, and that is the most important thing. Lena, I just want to come to you. You live in a very, very... A sort of technologically advanced country where especially the field you work in medicine is the future you quite possibly are from the future my question to you is do you ever get approached by young people who are not in in that in, have access to that same thing have you ever been on panels or maybe workshops where you, where it's you and you're there or you're present or you've got that super fast broadband and you're able to tweet away and the other person is probably from uganda or afghanistan and has dodgy internet and their voice isn't heard in the same way, literally. Uh, just, just an understanding from you as a, as a young activist. Yeah. So I've had an experience that was quite the opposite, actually. So we were presenting in Harvard, um, Green Mangroves, and um, there was a youth activist from uh, Kenya who was coming um, from there. And he basically had this huge social media following. He was well connected to the world. So I think sometimes we, we tend to think that um, in particular areas would have harder time connecting, but sometimes it's actually the opposite. They have so much potential that they're able to do it so well, even better than us sometimes. Just to maybe add to that, that's completely true. And I think also I've seen many young people use low-tech solutions as well. Oh, go on. So, you know, uh, messaging apps. Like they would use WhatsApp if they can't use Zoom or Microsoft Teams to have uh, their coordination meetings for, you know, climate protests. Um, I think uh, young people have been extremely creative and resilient in the face of lack of resources and have found very innovative ways even in the face of uh, difficulties to find ways to connect and make their voices heard. So moving on to our final audience question, uh, and then we'll get to the end of the show with a little surprise thrown in. So who, what is your question and who is it for? My question is to Lena, and I want to ask her if she thinks that someone in my age is capable of doing what you're doing, because most of us don't have the resources 
or the access to you know what you have so do you think i am for example me i'm capable of doing what you are great question lena um, so I actually remember being kind of your age and I used to be a really, really shy person. I would just go to school, come back home, very le regular days. But when you see something that you're interested in and then when you find out the right person to connect with and who can tutor you and men mentor you, I think that's where the magic happens. So I would suggest that you reach out to programs in your area, maybe teachers, mentors, people who are doing very well in the field that you're interested in and put a seat for yourself in that table you'll succeed even better, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you. A round of applause for our questioners and the responses. Well done, guys. So we are nearly about to wrap up. Uh, but before we go, I want to thank my phenomenal panelists who made it here and have been responsive and have been through quite a difficult two days here at the Youth for Climate Summit. They're all reeling from it. What you're seeing is an exhausted panel, ladies and gentlemen, and they've done astonishingly well. So thank you, give them a round of applause and give yourself a round of applause for coming here, for participating and for being a part of it. Thank you so much also to earthday.org, uh, Connect for Climate and the Qatar Foundation. Now, before we leave, I have a little bit of a surprise for you, a little gift, a little token from Dear World Live and Doha Debates, because today we are, in fact, launching a brand new initiative called Solving It 26. So Solving It 26 is a brand new initiative in which we profile 26 astonishing, amazing, brilliant, I can't think of words hyperbolic enough, uh, activists, uh, leaders and innovators within the climate change uh, conversation. In the weeks leading up to COP26 uh, the climate change conference, we will salute 26 amazing young climate champions. We're going to do it over on Instagram uh, and we will be publishing portraits of our Solving It 26 list of young climate activists and innovators whose vision and whose work we hope will inspire and, and actually catalyze real change and you'll learn all about them over the coming weeks. If you wanted to see the full list uh, of Solving It 26 honorees, you can learn more about their work. Just go to dohadebates.com forward slash Solving It 26. The page is indeed live today. Go to Instagram, go to Doha Debates. Follow us and you will see uh, a profile portrait of every one of these. And, and I have seen some of them. These are incredible people and we can connect you uh, to their work. And so you can feel maybe inspired, maybe moved, maybe even think about um, some of the things they're doing um, as, as a way to catalyze your change and your movement forward. So we've launched Solving It 26 uh, with Doha Debates. Thank you for being here. Thank you for coming. A big thank you to everyone uh, who's helped us put this together live in Milan. Dear World Live season four has only just begun. We have a show coming out that you can stream on many, many platforms on October the 13th, where Dear World Live will be discussing how we should change the way we eat and produce our food in the face of climate disaster. But for now, a massive thank you to everyone and a final round of applause for our guests and for all of you. Thank you and goodbye.